I like to move it, move it, and you like to move it, move it. We're going to be talking about movement and support today. Think about all the different ways that animals move. Dragonflies hover, earthworms wriggle, owls swoop down on their prey, whales breach, lemurs dance. All vertebrates and invertebrates face the same challenges as they move through, through or over air, water, or land. In order to move, animals use very different structures that work in similar ways. Let's take a look. Get your paper ready, wide right, skinny left. See you on the next slide. Animals need to move with efficiency and not waste precious energy. To move efficiently, all animals must do two things. They must generate physical force and that force must be applied against air, water, or land in order to push or pull themselves around. While invertebrates can move with ease, the ability to move efficiently is greatly enhanced by rigid body parts. Legs push against the ground, wings push against the air, and flippers or fins push against the water, as you see in the three diagrams here. Animals with a hydrostatic skeleton appear to have no skeleton at all, but nothing is further from the truth. Hydrostatic skeletons are fluid filled and their body is shaped or altered by contractile cells that act very much like muscles. We see hydrostatic skeletons in cnidarian and annelids such as jellyfish, earthworms, and sea anemone. In the last picture over on the right, we see a sea anemone open, waiting for its prey to happen by. But then in the next picture, we see how the contractile cells have worked to close the anemone up when it captured a crab. The term exoskeleton means outside or external skeleton. And this Perseus exoskeleton is a great example, although not a real skeleton. Arthropods have exoskeletons made of chitin. Chitin has come up quite a few times in our vocabulary after being introduced way back at the beginning of the year when we discussed carbon compounds. It's a very tough, complex carbohydrate, often combined with other compounds like lipids to affect different properties, like being waterproof. Mollusks, like this conch, which is really a giant snail, are mostly shelled animals like clams, scallops, and snails. Animals like squid and octopi are also mollusks with an internal shell. And then there are slugs, which are mollusks with no exoskeleton at all. Mollusk shells are made of another carbon compound, calcium carbonate, often combined with chitin. Exoskeletons are watertight and protective, as you may know if you remember cutting open the exoskeleton of the crawfish we dissected. Since exoskeletons are very rigid, they restrict the growth of an animal severely. So animals with an exoskeleton must molt in order to grow. One of the most common examples of this are the cicada shells that we find around here in the late summer months. Another disadvantage of the exoskeleton is that they're relatively heavy. The larger the arthropod gets, the heavier their exoskeletons become in proportion to their body weight. If you just remember this, then you can rest assured that the earth will never be taken over by giant ants, giant moths, giant spiders, giant crawfish, or any other giant arthropod for that matter. Whew. I was about to have nightmares about that one. Endoskeletons are structural support systems inside the body. Echinoderms such as sea stars and sand dollars have an endoskeleton. 
Their endoskeleton is made of calcified plates, usually joined together, as I see here in this sea star skeleton. This is also what's present when you find sand dollars on the beach. What you're really finding is sand dollar skeletons. Vertebrates, or animals with a vertebral column or backbone, have endoskeletons. These can be made up entirely of cartilage, as in sharks, or mostly bone with cartilage present in certain areas, as in most other vertebrates like the snake here. One adaptation that is of interest to biologists is that of limb girdles. As organisms began to walk on four and then on two legs, limb girdles in the pelvic and shoulder areas developed to support limbs and allow more efficient movement on land. Unlike animals with an exoskeleton, because endoskeletons are light in weight in proportion to the bodies they support, these animals can grow quite large. So we have elephants and blue whales. The evolution of endoskeletons has also created many variations for movement. Joints where two bones meet and move allow for this. Without joints, an animal could not move at all. Strong connective tissue called ligaments connects these bones to each other and it increases the strength of the overall skeleton allowing for some pretty fantastic displays of movement in the animal kingdom. Muscles are specialized tissue that produce physical force by getting shorter or contracting when they're stimulated. Muscles can relax when they're not being stimulated, but they cannot actively get longer. They only contract or get shorter. This presents a problem, but it's one that's solved by muscles working in pairs. Your biceps and triceps or quadriceps and hamstring muscles are examples of these pairs. These muscles are each attached to two different bones and when contracting, one of those muscles pulls those two bones together while the other relaxes. Arthropod muscles work in much the same way, except they're attached to the inside of the exoskeleton. As you can see in this picture, while one muscle contracts, the other relaxes, pulling the two appendages, uh, two appendage sections one way or the other. In vertebrates, muscle is not connected directly to bone, however. They're connected by tendons. So we see three different types of connective tissue present in joints along with muscles. Ligaments connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone, and cartilage is usually found at the end of the bones allowing bones to move slowly, smoothly over each other or past each other. If I study the shape of limbs and joints in vertebrate animals, I will find a wide variety of joints. The shape of the limb and the joint are closely linked to the type of movement allowed. Rotational, hinged, side to side, all different kind of movements that we see. And so yet, here's another example of the scientific law of form follows function. The shape of the joint determines the motion, and the need of motion determines the shape of the joint. This is why your elbow moves differently than your shoulder and moves differently than your neck or your jaw. And so, young Padawan, just what have you learned in this little section about movement and support? Well, you should be able to answer the following questions. What two body systems or structures work together to cause movement? Pretty easy. Compare and contrast the advantages and disadvantages of exoskeletons and endoskeletons. You should have that in your notes. Explain why muscles must move in pairs. Again, that's a pretty good level two question there. And lastly, think about this. 
Which would impair movement more, an injury to a tendon or an injury to a ligament? Think about real life examples and explain your answer. So with that, remember to draw a line, write a summary at the end of your notes, and don't forget your six questions, three level ones, two level twos, and one level three question. And with that, I am going to move it, move it, move it on out of here. See you guys in class. Bye.